sight of is uh, to understand nature as a, a system which kind of maintains itself. People are, uh, are very um, disempowered by, by, by the food system. Um, the introduction of supermarkets and that kind of stuff has had a lot of effects which, which it would be very interesting to study but, but I mean the food looks extremely uniform. Um, it's got to conform to some kind of ideal type of what it's supposed to look like. So it, it can't be slightly blemished or it can't be the wrong size or whatever. And it actually is extremely clean when you unwrap it. And I think one of the things you learn when you grow your own food is how long it takes to, to wash it, actually. <laughs> That's one of the few negative aspects. But um, it, it's an education. I think people, you know, in, in the urban context, pe people have lost actually a sense that food does grow somewhere and, and, and what, what, what that involves. This is a very important issue, which I think is, is really something we can address, particularly in the context of a university. The grand challenge for sustainable cities is one of UCL's grand challenges. What's interesting about grand challenges is we allow people to work across disciplines to look at challenges that are that particular societal relevance. Um, food has been something that's come up again and again. Things like the way people eat, what people eat, um, where they eat, where they source things from, are all very important issues for sustainable cities. Under feudalism, most people were producing their own food. Under um, urbanised capitalism, that's not the case. And so you then have to feed the city, feed the population who then become passive consumers. So th this pushes the, the whole problem to a much higher level. It, 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 it is something which has gone wrong with uh, humanity and its attitude to, to, towards nature. And um, it is something which has been in, in, entrenched in, uh, in kind of ruling classes throughout history. If you have a, um, a social class which can organize uh, production, then this gives it a, a reason to exist. This is kind of the historical background in terms of um, agrarian societies which were very exploitative. And then capitalism comes in in the 16th century and, and then more so in the 18th and 19th century uh, when capitalism becomes industrial capitalism. And then uh, of course you began to get with industry, you began to get urbanization. Traveling covered cities is they are these wonderfully um, compact places for people to live but they don't really have the surface area to support every single person who lives there so they rely very much on the surrounding areas so that they're part of, they're part of resource networks and those resource networks can have a lot of implications for the way cities work, the way the food gets in, the way the waste gets out. global population is increasing and there are obviously scare stories which have been around for a long time they were there in the 19th century they were they were there in the 1960s about population rise and not being able to feed the planet and therefore the uh, temptation of having a, a very uh, simplified uh, solution was, was 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 pretty appealing one aspect of this would be monocropping that, that you've got very large fields which are, which are growing the same crop finding ways to get rid of weeds or to get rid of uh, insects which might eat those things from a ecological physical point of view then the current system is not sustainable because the soil is being eroded and uh, you know it, it, it will kind of disappear within a few decades and in a socio-political sense obviously you know the food is, is maldistributed and, and there is all sorts of exploitation and people are alienated uh, but both uh, psychologically and in terms of be being cut off from their contact with the land. We have this thing called complexity theory, which is taking us back to the way in which traditional indigenous people used to look at nature. And in a sense, it's harmonious and it's got equilibrium because all the parts fit together and they work together. But the other aspect, which is less obvious, is that it, uh, it embraces uh, disequilibrium because in a uh, natural system, you constantly had climate challenges. And in evolutionary theory, these kind of shocks to a system help it evolve because the, the system learns to adapt to these kind of shocks. Can we apply the same principles to society? 
it's more about devolving power to local communities and, and, and rehabilitating small farms. And there are a number of ideas we talked like about commons. You view the earth as a common uh, treasury, but not in the sense that we're simply sort of withdrawing stuff from it. I mean, we are stewards of it. We have stewardship over it. And if we can use these kind of techniques of self-organization and apply them to society, then society will also become resilient. We'd be able to embrace fresh shocks. In a physical sense, uh, we're practicing agroecology, which is simply creating an agricultural system which is like an ecology. I wanted to have a system where I could do stuff compatibly with a mainstream job. And the principle we could learn from is low input farming. We're cutting out the input of chemicals and stuff like this, but it's also um, low input of labor and low input of time. This is really a way of starting plants off to prevent them from being attacked by slugs. This is beetroot and, and spinach and cress and they're quite different varieties of plant but they all seem to work very well in this method so you grow them till they reach a certain size in in these gutters and then you simply slide them out of the gut into the ground there are several stages of composting and this is kind of the final stage so the, the, this is completely composted down and and there's almost no sign of what the, the matter was that, that made the compost. And so that, that's kind of the end product of the whole of composting. We've got several different stages going at the same time. There's a large composting area here. So there's a small layer of manure on top, but, it, but it's mostly green stuff from the plot. So this is pretty, uh, this is pretty warm. I don't know if you can see the steam coming out of it. it. It remains hot for a while, and this is a bacteria working very, very intensively. And then it cools down, and the worms move in. You know, it, it would be too hot for the worms at the moment. But they are around, and they, and they are keeping an eye on it. Worms are quite shy, but they're in here somewhere. Yes, so there is a beautiful specimen. These are the ones which, they're red, reddish colored worms. In a forest environment, they, they would be working in the upper layer. So they, they'd be working in the layer of leaf mold which falls off the trees. They don't penetrate deep into the soil. The whole of this area is kind of alive with pumpkin growing, which is really nice. It's not dead from the point of view of food growing. I think it's important to think about staples because staples are, are the main basis of the diet. So these are salad potatoes. We're getting a much bigger yield per plant for this variety. We'd aimed to produce about 100 kilos of potatoes. Once you've sorted out the staples, then this will keep you alive. And then we just try to grow everything else because we obviously want that variety. Yeah, these are parsnips and uh, they were grown in a gutter. They're growing very nicely. So we got a very good crop and they've got a great flavor. This is um, the maize. We just uh, started eating it, so um, it, it's a variety which is uh, pale in colour, but it's very, very sweet. So it's really nice like this when it's uh, uh, you hardly need to cook it. So you, you you kind of steam it for five minutes or something like this, and it's it's uh, it's really really great. We try to experiment with some unusual things. This is a herb called red uh, orange, which is um, really quite attractive. And so th this is an edible plant. And um, it's reasonably nice. <laughs> <laughs> this area here, this magical plant called comfrey, and that um, has got very deep roots, which go in below the layer of the soil. And so it, it accesses a lot of minerals. Uh, you don't access in the soil and it draws them up into the leaves. Uh, th there's a kind of drip method which I heard about somewhere and have developed a little bit and, and eventually it, it converts itself into a very concentrated form which is this um, black 
liquid and <clears throat> this is an incredibly uh, concentrated form of nutrient which is kind of drawn up from the layers of the, of the from the center of the earth basically you know normally in in, in organic uh, farming you say you you feed the soil not not the plant so in that sense we don't normally think about fertilizer but but nevertheless um, uh, it, you, you can increase the vigor of the plant by, by, by giving it this stuff and it, it is quite miraculous so that this is a really essential ingredient. There are people coming from all over to kind of look at the work we're doing but, but I think in, within the allotment we view this being very very peculiar and, and possibly somewhat dangerous. The allotment movement which is very traditionally it's very English but but Actually, the, the the mainstay of it of it has very often been n new uh, communities who come into the country. So it, it is diverse, and at the same time, funnily enough, it is the same tradition which has always been there. So England has sort of reinvented itself in a different kind of way. So this is something which the kind of the right wing nationalistic discourse completely fails to spot. Being part of the allotment movement, we really feel we're part of something. And there is a lot of kind of love and mutual support which, which is there. And it is a commons in action. There is this huge sense of continuity with a working class cooperative tr tradition. And in a broader sense, I think the new food related urban social movements are doing the same thing in a new way. They are creating mut mutually supportive networks, different forms of, of collaboration, and, and, and they are functioning as a commons. So I think that what's encouraging is that the elements of the new social order are there and we simply have to explore them and bring them together. Thank you, Robert, for inviting me here. It's a, a wonderful setting, and I can't think of, of a better manifestation of why it's so important for cities to, to embrace um, green space and to think about what can be grown to provide well-being and, and, and food in the city. With transition towns, we generally talk about food feeds and not food miles, so try to have the food grown as close to you as possible, and if you can grow it yourself, all the better. And of course, food is very important as a way of engaging communities, getting conversations started within communities. So within Transition Town Brixton, we have something called the Remakery, which tries to get people together to remake, to reuse, to upcycle the goods that they've used. There are between 2,600 and 3,000 transition towns all around the world. So wherever you are in the world, if you put Google Transition Network, there's bound to be a transition town near you. I think there's a need to repair the psychological rupture that young people have with the land. International organizations like the FAO have been trying to encourage young people to get into farming and to get into agriculture, but they seem puzzled as to why young people reject this move towards agriculture. And I think it's because the forms, these models that we're using now, don't appeal to young people who want to be a part of movements that are more localized, one, but also more sustainable in terms of the forms of production. Social movements don't have to be highly visible and mass protest movements to be effective. Young people can self-organize at the local level to address a very big issue of sustainable food production, but starting with just your own home garden or your own community garden in a cooperative format. What they need to emerge from though is a context in which it becomes acceptable for people to self-organize and we stop being afraid of young people coming together and organizing themselves to make a change that we don't feel threatened by young people but see them as a constructive force
to get the knack one to hit the genesis emphasis i got the facts when we catch a store led we're bringing a remedy providing a profit for the permaculture unity our activities are open to feedback from others we thrive from the system from the sisters and brothers we vibe who forces we know they are worthless our service to use them with a purpose yeah. with a purpose <laughs> In a sense, agroecology is is not just a, a farming technique. It it is a, a different philosophy of existence. It's a different way in which we relate to the natural world and to each other. I think it, it, it can't be separated from that. We're not only healing the farming system; we're healing ourselves and and everything else. And so it it is a big it is a big task. But nevertheless, obviously, it's what it's one we have to undertake. Mm -hmm.